He lost more than a million dollars in jewelry during a highly publicized robbery at his Brooklyn church. Now, the so-called Bling Bishop is also poised to lose his freedom. Lamar Whitehead facing decades in prison after a jury convicted him today on federal charges, including wire fraud and attempted extortion. Flexing millions of dollars, wearing luxury clothes, and riding around New York City in a Rory's voice. This is Lamar Whitehead. This man was supposed to be a man of spreading the gospel. But this supposed bishop was nothing more than a swindler, scammer, who deceived millions of people and stole millions of dollars. His preachings of personal enrichment was disguised as religious doctrine that captivated millions of followers, who was caught up in his flashy success stories, but ignored the warnings of his sneaky, greedy ways. Behind his flashy lifestyle, he's nothing but a scammer in disguise, pushing a message of greed and lies. This is the shocking story of Lamar Whitehead, the bling bishop of Brooklyn. The roots of Lamar Whitehead is shrouded in mystery, almost as murky as his later actions being a complete scammer. He was born in 1978. He claims to be the son of Arthur Miller Jr., a man who tragically died in police custody after being arrested for a suspended license. This is where the story gets a little confusing. It turns out that Miller's family's records tell a completely different story. Arthur only had one son, age 12, and three other girls aged between 8 and 16 when he passed away. So the question is, did Whitehead make up a story for a dramatic storyline? He even posts about this supposed father on Instagram. But we're not the only ones questioning his family connection. Arthur's youngest daughter, the real one with a birth certificate, has said she knows nothing about Lamar Whitehead being her supposed half-brother. She said that even Whitehead contacted her decades ago. He claimed to be the stepbrother, but she insists her father never acknowledged Whitehead as his son or mentioned him at all. And this is a huge red flag. And you'll see more red flags later on in the story. Whitehead apparently asked Miller's family for money, claiming to know about the funds related to his alleged father's tragic death. So Miller Bradford got furious and challenged him to take a DNA test to prove his claims. And according to reports, Whitehead just hung up the phone. But why does all this matter, other than the fact that he's probably finding a way to be a scammer? It's because Arthur Miller's death had a big impact on the country 40 years before the George Floyd incident. His death sparked a lot of protests at the time. So this is why his daughter is so upset that Lamar is using and making up this story to act like he's fighting for something. Whitehead not only ignores Miller Bradford's accusations, calling her a liar, but he even tells the media to do a DNA test, which he refused to do himself. His lawyer won't say if Miller's name is on Whitehead's birth certificate. After high school, Whitehead got offers from good universities for sports scholarships, but instead of sports, he chose to study accounting and videography at a small college in New Mexico. But he went back to Brooklyn after his studies. Lamar Whitehead seemed to dive into the spotlight. He tried acting, modeling, even recording some hip-hop songs. But those things didn't go so well because he later got into real estate as a mortgage broker. And speaking of real estate, Whitehead's business seemed to be doing really well. So well, in fact, he managed to buy a nearly half a million dollar house in New Jersey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Bishop, Bishop Whitehead. And I'll walk you out into my prayer closet. This is my prayer closet. And then when you walk into my shoe closet, every designer wear, designer wear for days, for days, for days, for days, for days. But like so often happens when people climb too fast, his success came crashing down dramatically. In 2004, authorities were getting loads of complaints from people saying that the identities were being used illegally to buy Range Rovers. Soon after, the police arrested a suspect for identity theft. When they looked into it, they found someone else at the same address as the suspect. Guess who? Yeah, you already know. Authorities quickly thought that Whitehead was somehow involved, maybe as an accomplice or even a leader. But that's when a year-long hunt to catch him began. While he was on the loose, Whitehead was not going to waste any more time. He took advantage of his freedom and kept on scamming. In 2005, he asked for a hefty loan of $200,000 from a renowned film director. This tells you that Lamar know how to rub shoulders with the right people. Lamar promised to pay it back in a month with a generous interest of $25,000, but he never kept his word. Three years later, a lawsuit from that director for about $306,000 landed at his doorstep, or should I say at the prison bars, because finally in 2005, the police finally caught up with him thanks to a tip off. Someone has bought a motorcycle in Brooklyn using someone else's data and was driving around in a maroon Range Rover. 
it was uncovered that Whitehead was running an extensive identity fraud and death ring to secure at least $2 million in loans and purchase high-end vehicles. Over 50 identified victims across multiple states were stripped of their identities by the scammer's insatiable greed. Charges poured onto Whitehead, who in 2008 was found guilty and sentenced to five years behind bars, a sentence that, far from reforming him, only seemed to have hardened him in his deceitful ways. Whitehead headed straight to the ministry. He studied at a New York cemetery and obtained a certification from the Theological Institution of Raising Hope, accredited through Nyack College. Overnight, this ex-convict became an authorized chaplain and efficient for weddings and funerals. You guys already know where this is going to go. Lamar Whitehead's life is a saga of glitz and glamour. From this point on, he became known as the Blame Bishop of Brooklyn, where he leads a church called the Leaders of Tomorrow International Ministry. He told the New York Times, quote, I have a calling and I had to do what I had to do. Well, it seems like that divine message he was supposed to preach was the prosperity gospel, which when you think about it, makes some sense. The prosperity gospel is the belief that God rewards the faithful with material wealth and health. Lamar told the New York Magazine that he doesn't promise riches to his people. He said, I quote, I will tell you how to get in alignment with the word of God. So therefore that you could be in a position of the blessing, unquote. It is worth noting when he gave that interview, he was dressed in a luxurious and elegant charcoal Calvin Klein suit with a solid brown tie. So the guy was looking fresh as he talked his nonsense. Through the charitable acts like handing out turkeys at Christmas and organizing an annual hip hop in the honor of the church service, he made his way into the upper echelons in Brooklyn. In 2016, he made Asia his wife, who now runs her own online ministry, along with a mentoring program and a company. But his most controversial was with Eric Adams. At that time, he was just a Brooklyn borough president. Whitehead bragged about how close he was with Adams, who he saw as a father figure since he didn't have his own father around. Whitehead says, quote, everyone sees him as a mayor. I see Eric differently. I see him as someone who helped me keep my dignity, unquote which sounds odd, but it probably strengthened their bond because there was a time then, despite his failed attempts to organize a gospel concert at Barclays Center, Whitehead claimed that Adams counseled him and encouraged him to learn from his mistakes, something a father would supposedly do. But looking back, Whitehead's actions show that he was a clever and manipulative man who knew how to get close to very powerful people. In May 2022, Whitehead used his connection to the mayor to offer himself as a mediator when the shooter in a subway incident left 20 people injured and it had the city on edge for over 24 hours. His attempt to negotiate with assailant, which he claimed to have arranged with the mayor, failed, and the perpetrator was arrested by police before the pastor could bring him back into line. Two months later, after that subway incident, Lamar Whitehead was robbed at gunpoint over a million dollars worth of jewelry, including a thick chain necklace and a $75,000 Rolex, while giving a sermon at his church in Canarsie, a neighborhood in Brooklyn. The robbery carried out by three men grabbed headlines, shining a spotlight at Whitehead's flashy lifestyle as well as his long-standing relationship with Adams, you know, the standing father, who now might be getting dragged in the same mess as Whitehead. But the question remains, how can a church pastor afford such extravagant luxuries? Is that what God's message is about? Give me your money? But funny enough, when asked about his expensive clothing, Whitehead doesn't hesitate to mention that even the Pope spends a lot on his outfits. He even brings up the historical article from 1908, estimating that Pope Pius X's clothes cost $50,000 a year. But he goes even further, citing passages from the Bible about wealthy kings and apostles to justify his own wealth. Whitehead seems to imply that his position allows him to enjoy luxury and abundance, hiding his true ambitions under a veil of supposed spirituality. When it comes to explaining where his money is coming from, Bishop Lamar Whitehead treads on the same slippery ground as all of his actions. He vaguely mentions real estate ventures, highlighting an apartment complex he owns in Connecticut, but the tenants paint a very different picture of that of a great landlord. According to reports, Whitehead has been pushing rent increases and evicting these residents who protest against the poor living conditions they face. Are his supposed properties nothing more than just a new scheme to attract money from the most vulnerable people out there? Behind the facade of wealth lies a darker landscape. In 2020, a judge ruled against him for failing to make payments for the Mercedes-Benz and the Range Rover. This is where the hits just keep on coming. In the next year, he was hit with another big judgment for failing to pay back a real estate loan. And as recently as September 2022, he was sued again for not keeping up with a loan to fix up the same apartment complex in Hartford that he owns. All these debts, lawsuits, and accusations of not paying completely destroyed the image of him of being a successful businessman that Whitehead 
tried so hard to show off. We're gonna ask this question, where was he really getting his money from? Well, the answer might be just fraud, fraud, and more fraud. I guess for Whitehead, it's tough to break away from bad habits. The Bling Bishop made the news again in the summer of 2022 when another woman, 56-year-old Pauline Addison, accused him of scamming her. She said that while she was recovering from surgery, Whitehead convinced her to empty her, her entire savings account, her entire life savings, to give him a $90,000 investment, promising he would use it to buy and fix up a house for her. Deception is what this federal accusation is all about. You see, the house was never built and the money just vanished into Lamar's design clothing pockets. The pastor later explained to the woman that he considered the funds a campaign donation for his failed attempt to replace Adams as the president of the Brooklyn Borough President. Prosecutors, however, believe the money was spent on luxury items worth thousands of dollars. The cars, the goods from Louis Vuitton, and Foot Locker. Whitehead never helped the victim get the house and has not returned the money, despite her asking. Before the federal indictment was filed, Whitehead defended himself in statements to New York Magazine. Dismissive, he says that he owes nothing to the woman and claims to be attacked out of envy for being glamorous. But wait, there's more. As if there wasn't enough, he was also accused of extortion. Whitehead allegedly used threats to force a Bronx businessman to give him $5,000. He promised the victim that he can get, quote, favors from the New York City government if he gave him a half a million dollars along with a share in some real estate deals. This accusation points to him just being a liar. He knew very well he had no way to get these favors from the mayor's office. Not even his close relationship with Eric Adams can help him with that. Now, Eric Adams had a statement that came from his office. Adams called the charges against Whitehead, quote unquote, disturbing, saying that he deserves the presumption of innocence. He said, I spent decades enforcing law and expect everyone to follow it. I also dedicated my life to helping people with troubled past like Whitehead. While these accusations are worrying, I won't say any more until the process is complete. So he basically just threw him under the bus and completely washed his hands of this entire nonsense, in my opinion. What do you guys think? And finally, a couple of weeks ago, Lamar Whitehead, the bling bishop, was found guilty of five charges, including wire fraud, attempted extortion, and lines. He's looking at decades behind bars. A Manhattan federal jury today finding Whitehead guilty of defrauding a parishioner and trying to extort a businessman. It's been a long time coming and we're very happy to see that the verdict was guilty today. Con artists, they're really slick. They have a knack for twisting things into their favor and guess where they love to hang out sometimes? Most of the time, churches. You see, churches are all about forgiveness and giving folks a second shot at life. It's a beautiful thing for the most part. It really is. The problem is there's some shady people looking to take advantage of all of this goodness. They know people there want to believe the best in others. So they use that to their advantage. That's Whitehead to the T. He shows up at church, spinning a tale of their rough past and how they're looking for a fresh start. It's just like a scene out of a movie. Everyone looks to help. But the problem is, and this is the catch, not everyone is telling a sob story is generally looking to turn over a new leaf. Some are just looking for the next big score, the next big play. Now, most of the time, most churches and religious institutions are full of the most kindness, most forgiving people you ever meet. It's all about love, kindness, and yes, second chances. But that good stuff right there, that's the same open heartness that sometimes make them a target for those with less than honorable intentions. This story hits me pretty hard because I live in Brooklyn. As he was doing his thing in Canarsie, I've been born and raised in Crown Heights. Witnessing someone that comes from the same background, exploiting people, it's pretty terrible. It's a sad truth in these neighborhoods like ours. Every day is a struggle, and people like Whitehead are not looking to uplift, but to exploit. Our community is full of hardworking people just trying to make ends meet. And when they go to churches seeking solace and hope in their faith, churches are supposed to be sanctuaries, places of refuge where people can find strength and the broken people can heal. But when scammers, draped in the guise of spiritual leaders, enter these sacred spaces, they just don't steal money. They rob people of their faith and their hope. Whitehead, posing as a man of God, he took advantage of the trust and the reverence people had for him, manipulating their faith for his financial gain. Imagine saving every penny, denying yourself of life, little pleasures, all for a better future, only to hand it someone who promises to multiply it in the name of faith. That's what happened to this nurse, a parishioner mother who hand her life savings to Whitehead, hoping for a blessing, but was left with betrayal. Thankfully, his greedy nonsense has come to an end. But what you guys think about this story? Let me know. Have you ever had an issue with someone of faith taking advantage of you? Let me know. Put in the comments below. Thank you for taking time to watch this video. And I'll see you guys in the next video.